so all of the, uh, you ought to be looking around, all of the Hudson Greens that we were able to find, which is like 10 years of Hudson Green are all available through the website. Uh, there's forms that are out there, et cetera, et cetera. So please check out the website. Also, the website does have all our future meetings with information. So that'll keep you up to date instead of saying, what's going on next month? Roger. Yes. Gary wants to know how he gets to log in as a member. Okay. When you go to the website, go on the left side, there's, it says membership. Click that. And that will give you a place for you to log in with your ID and password. If you have forgotten your ID or password, there's a little uh, help thing, question mark. I don't remember, forgot, et cetera, do that thing. And uh, it's pretty helpful because we do have the email that you originally signed up with. So if you're having trouble, it will send you an email when you say help and it'll send you a reminder on your password or allow you to reset your password. So go to the website, click members on the left and uh, log in and you're good to go. Okay, evaluating genealogical evidence or where's the beef? One thing uh, that got me when I first started my research back in 93 was uh, sources, source citations. And so I have always tended to focus on that as being a pretty important thing because it doesn't do any good to record information and it turns out it's not your people, uh, assuming you want facts and reality in your uh, tree, or you could just go enter George Washington. And if you're happy with that, go for it. But personally, I prefer to have the people that are on my family tree to actually be my ancestors. Uh, I will admit that I go back quite a ways based on one website um, that it's a little iffy, but that's all I got. But that that's, you know, when I get past, as I say, over the pond, when I'm over in Europe. But for United States stuff, I'm pretty confident that what I've got is documented. So that's what I want to talk about today. History is not just a collection of documents and all records are not created equal. You should analyze and decide what to believe or trust and you need certain facts about the records themselves. There's types of evidence. There is a quality. Um, I assign a quality. There's no reference book telling you that this book is the best quality possible, but you should have some personal opinion about the quality of any given piece of evidence. Just because Roger said so doesn't mean it's 100% true. Uh, and remember, a large number of rumors does not represent a fact. Did the person creating the source have a motivation to guess, invent, whatever? You've got to consider the creator of the source. Uh, the information sometimes just the process of recording, transferring, transcribing, trying to copy information. And I'll show you an example of this where information disappeared. The case is never closed. Just because you've recorded it, recorded you found, you found your great grandfather, doesn't mean that you never need to update or consider reviewing that information and a little bit about myths and mistakes. Okay, types of evidence. Direct, this is something that addresses the fact in question. For example, a birth record, a marriage record, a death record. For relatively current events, 
These would be a birth certificate, marriage uh, certificate, death certificate, something created officially at the time of the event. Indirect or circumstantial requires some more effort to evaluate. It's not less effective because it's circumstantial, but it has to be consistent, connected to the other information you've got and conclusive. Roger? A, yes. I don't think your slides are advancing. We're still on the first slide. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Let me see. Screen sharing. Did that change anything? This slide is type of evidence. That's the title. No, we're still on evaluating genealogical evidence. Okay. Just a second here. Try this screen share. How's that? Roger? Yes. Um, perhaps you not you don't want to present the show. Zoom is doing something weird. Um, yeah. Use the slides on the left and manually advance. Yep. Hang on. New share. Just a second. Did that work? No. Okay. It's a new update and they're saying that you have to manually advance from the slides on the left. You can't do the normal presentation. Well, see, I don't have slides on the left. Exit the presentation. Exit the presentation. Okay. Remember our little discussion? <laughs> well, I think everybody understands in this world technology has little bumps we'll get it just give us a minute or two i lost you roger well everybody <laughs> give us a minute or two roger will come zooming back in the meantime i would tell you that he's going to really go over um, how to evaluate evidence and what is a good piece of evidence and what isn't Give us a second. We're working on it. Okay, I'm back. I see Gwen. Oh, sorry, everybody. I was muted again. Yep. Okay. Do you want to send me your presentation and we'll try and run it from here? Okay, I can do that. Hang on. And thank you, whoever is telling us about the Zoom in last week where it happened. It's got something to do with the Zoom update. That, oh. that much we know. Well, isn't that wonderful?
Am I back with my audio? You, I can hear you. Okay, well, I'm getting comments. They can't hear me. Okay, just a second. Subject meeting. Attach a file. Send. Okay. All right. Let me see if I got it. Not yet, but you know how slow the internet is. Yep. You will give it a minute or two and it should pop through. In the meantime, we can tell them, do you know the date of the December meeting, Roger? I had forgotten. I didn't write it down. Uh, well, I would have to go to the website. <laughs> <laughs> I, I rely on the website to keep track of what's happening. Oh, sorry, everybody. Saturday morning bumps. Have another cup of coffee while we get this situated. December 10. Thank you. Uh, tips on finding immigration and naturalization records. With Nancy and Steve Chilinski Powers. And believe me, they have been working weeks on this presentation. Well, oh, good. I still don't have it, Roger. Okay, well, hang on. You want to send it to the library account? Please click. You sent me something here, just a second. Oh, it's a new Zoom notice. All right, compose. When? Oh, I got something. Where did I get it? Got it, thank you, Roger. Okay. Now, well, let me do this. We're almost there, everybody. Work real close. Just give us another minute or two. Okay, I've got you back. Okay, our tech person is on it. Well, it's a good thing somebody's on it. <laughs> Roger, Edwards wants to know about the, the slide presentation. It, will it be in a handout? And you're telling everybody it's gonna be on the website. It will be in the handout on the website. It's a PowerPoint presentation that will be in the documents section of the Hudson Gen site. Okie doke. Hang on one more step here. Let me see if there are other questions. All of a sudden, I got lots of questions. Um, December 10th. Cindy, am I, Cindy, you can hear me, right? Oh, thank you, Cindy. They're loading your presentation now. Okay. There it comes. Okay, who's gonna advance the slides? Our wonderful technology person. Some of you may know her as Alexandra, but Alex will do it for you. Okay. Because she has your presentation. 
and we're loading it up to the website. So just give us another second. I'm going to disappear. Okay, Alex, thank you. Okay, next slide. As I said, it's not just a collection of documents. All records are not equal. Need to analyze. Yep, go to full screen. Need to analyze and decide what to believe and what to trust. Go to the next slide. Okay, there are different types of evidence. And the source of that is something you need to be aware of and think about. Um, is there quality or quantity? As I said, a large number of rumors do not represent a fact. I prefer a few quality bits of information to hundreds of questionable bits of information. Does the creator have a motivation to be sure it's correct? Information get lost in the process. I will explain that when we get to the slide. The case is never closed and some myths and mistakes. Next slide. Okay, direct evidence. This is stuff that talks specifically about the fact we're interested in. A birth certificate, marriage certificate, death certificate. Indirect, a baptismal record. Well, clearly if there was a baptism, the child was born, but that does not tell you the date of birth. So that is indirect, it's only circumstantial. I have some cases where a family was baptized and everybody was baptized on the same date. Well, clearly that tells me that's when they joined the church, not when the children were born. Census records and headstones, there's date calculations. Census records, and I'll show you example, are not absolute. And headstones are what somebody told the guy carving the headstone. So all you know with the presence of a headstone is the person's probably dead. Next slide. Okay, here is an early record written 1769. So it was reasonably close to the date of the event of the birth. But if you look at this record, you can see that it goes down starting on the right, it's January and it's by date, then February, and then it goes to March. But somewhere in there, we've got a February 29th. And it also Thomas Oliver Saunders, who is shown as born on the 29th, his name is written differently than everybody else. So my interpretation is that that information was recorded after, sometime in March or April, sometime after the, well, there's numerous problems. One, there's no 29th of February and it was clearly added afterwards. So there's some questions about that. Now, Thomas was born towards the end of February, but there is some questions. I do not have the answer for that. Next slide. Okay, here we're looking at a US census. This is the 1870 US census, and I'm looking for the birth month of Lydia. Lydia is the person on line two, um, and I've got circled here, August, uh, it was recorded in uh, the fifth day of August in 1870. And we have Lydia. Next slide is a close up. So the column there says age at the last birth date. If under one year, give month as a fraction. So we have Lydia, a second, I'm gonna try something here. We have Lydia, um, obviously 
was under one year old. But now we get into interpreting some, there are some questions. Let's go to the next slide. Now, looking up Lydia on Ancestry, they get 27 people having access to this same census record. Say she was born in September of 1869. And I'm suggesting that the record might mean November of 1869. The reason for that is that there were instructions to the um, census taker. So go to the next slide. The enumerator, that's the person that's going knocking on the doors is supposed to ask the questions as if it was June 1st, 1870. Now, so immediately we've got some questions because this census was not taken, this information was not taken on June 1st. It was done August 5th. So did the person, did the census taker follow the instructions and record it correctly did the people answer the question correctly? So there's a bunch of questions about when Lydia's birth date actually was. Could be May of 1870, could be November of 1870. There's a number of questions. You would really want to find another bit of information that might help you decide what is the correct date. This is what happens when you just see something and say, oh joy, oh joy, I found her, her birth date. You need to say, what is that information really telling you? Next slide. What evidence do you have? Do you accept all evidence you find or do you require the evidence to actually prove itself. Next slide. Okay. Let's search for my third great grandfather who went by Edwin, Edward or Ed Snell, uh, born 1804 in Massachusetts, according to the 1860 and 1870 federal census and an 1874 headstone. However, the 1850 census indicates he was born in New York, but also had him born in 1808. Next slide. So I have his headstone says died December 11, 1874, age 70 years, 10 months, 14 days. This calculates to him being born January 27, 1804. Vital Records for Bridgewater, Massachusetts has three Ed Snells, one born in 1803, one in 1804, one in 1805. Now the 1804 record says January 27, 1804. But my approach on this was it turns out that one of the three Ed Snells had parents and multiple ancestors with information. Two of the Edward Snells, there was no other information beyond the parents available. So obviously I knew which one I wanted it to be, but I didn't fall for that trap I said, I need to be absolutely certain because I have conflicting information. Okay, we lost the screen, maybe. I'll keep talking. We have conflicting information um, as to which one of them might be. So I was confronted with the task of disproving two. So I had to research all three Ed Snell's trying to find which one or two I could eliminate. Luckily, 
I was able to find marriage records for one of them and it listed the parents for that one. And one of them passed away and there was information on a death record, a will listing parent. So I was able to, by identifying the parents of all three Ed Snells, finding out that two of them were somewhere else or had died, I was able to eliminate them. Next slide. And so I, while well, the headstone can match the information from Massachusetts, I'm not willing to just take anything that works to make it easy for me. Next slide. She's so having based difficulty, on, right? Oh, there it goes. Yeah. So based on this, this is, this is what I have in my genealogical record. I have, you know, the basic information about Ed and his parents, et cetera, et cetera. But in the box, I actually added notations that he was, that my Ed Snell was not the Ed Snell born in this date and nor was he the Ed Snell born in that date. So I have not only just recorded the information I found that supports who he is, but I reported the evidence that disproves the other two Ed Snells. So that if anybody questions or comes up with some other reason to question the data, I have not only proven who he was, but disproved the others. So as far as I'm concerned, you can't get much better than this. So do you just think about this for a moment? You follow that. I didn't just print the easy stuff. I printed the hard stuff that was in the work. So I would hope that people might say, oh, this Roger Marble, he did a reasonably good job of confirming who is Ed Snell. And the reason for that is when you go back through Ed, I go back another four or five generations. So I didn't want people saying, well, Roger took this just so he could get four or five more generations. So I made, I worked real hard. This took me a couple of years to get all that data because I had to, like I said, I'm researching all three of the Ed Snells. And I couldn't just find, oh, this Ed Snell died, you know, uh, in 1825 in Massachusetts. Well, yeah, but is, which, which Ed Snell is that? I had to find them with information about their parents because their birth record gives their parents. And then I had to find a death record or some reason why they were not my Ed Snell. Next slide. All right, another challenge. We all have people where you do not have the details. Yes, yes, correct. Three Eds are better than one. Um, but Lucy, I do not have a death date. What I have is her being named in a will uh, in 1789. So I know that she was alive in 1789, but I don't know when she died. Now, I have her parents' names, but I don't have any other information for her parents. So. I have shown here estimated dates because my program sorts the people in my database by date of birth. If I leave it blank and I have two people with the same name, I don't know which one I'm working with. So I have to then open another web page and this and that. And it's, so it's cumbersome for me. So I have entered for almost all of my people in my program, some birth date. But I'm not going to just enter the date, because if I just enter the date, that means I have some reason to believe that's it. So I put estimated. So I'm clearly waving a little flag saying, well, maybe. Next slide. 
Okay, here we have Thomas and Margaret, and this is uh, Lucretia family. And what I've got here is the family includes, um, I got Margaret, the mother, and we've got nine children, with Lucretia being child number nine. It turns out I have birth dates for the other children. And so I asked the question, how old would the mother be to have a child born in 1737 and to have a child born in 1753? So Reuben was the first child. Would it be reasonable to say the mother was 20 when Reuben was born? Yeah, that's possible. And would it be reasonable for the mother, Margaret, to be 36 when Lucretia was born? Yeah, that's possible. But I will admit that after thinking about this for a few years, I think I have Margaret's uh, being too old because back in the early 1700s, I think it's more likely that Margaret was a teenager. So I think I have her born too early. I think it's entirely possible that Margaret was actually born in 1720 or 1721, not in 1717. So I need to go back in and adjust that estimated birth date to make her younger at the birth of her first child. Because 36 years old is a little old for having a child in the 1870s. It's not too old today, but medical stuff reality made that less likely. So, I'm going to be adjusting this in my actual data. And please note on the bottom of this group sheet, my program lists the sources uh, for each of the other bits of information. So that if you only saw this family group sheet, you would be able to do some further research to look at this information. Uh, providing a footnote on the family group sheet is a bit of confirming, adding some proof, more evidence to the information I've got. It's hard to see on this slide, but each of those uh, footnotes, one, two, three, four, five, reference the actual document where I got them. Next slide. Okay, some people suggest that three to five sources are required. Sometimes only a single source is ever found. Uh, there is no hard and fast rule that you shall have two sources. Da, 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 da. It's not, not realistic. It might be desirable, but it's not realistic. You have to try, if possible, you would like to have multiple sources. Uh, some may be circumstantial, and having a good number of circumstantial bits of evidence can sometimes help, but they'll help corroborate the one source you have that you believe is more reliable. Next slide. Original versus derivative. Original is firsthand knowledge, something a person witnessed, an original document. A derivative is everything else. So an original source might be a uh, church record of the date of a marriage, because that was recorded by the minister or priest at the time of the event, and the location. And it's reasonable that that minister or priest 
had firsthand knowledge that this couple and so named were in fact married on that date. But having something from a newspaper saying Fred and Ethel were born or were married, well, there is a possibility for a mistake, an error to have been made between the actual date and, pub and the date that was published in the newspaper. So that's a little bit of a trick question, but unless something was personally witnessed by the person that recorded the evidence, it's derivative, not original. Is a census original or derivative? Well, it depends on what bit of information you're looking at. Obviously, the census taker knows where they are. They know the date of the census because that's noted on the census page itself. But most of the other information is derivative because they're depending upon information provided to the census taker by somebody else. And in some cases, I think we all are aware of this, um, that they, the censor taker would knock on the door and whoever answered the door is the one that gets asked the questions. That could be the mother or wife, or it could be the 14 year old daughter who may or may not know dates and places and all that other stuff for all her siblings. So, while the census is pretty reliable, you need to remember that the first bit of information being collected was not necessarily being collected from a person that knew the truth and knew the facts. Next slide. Okay. Are all transcripts, abstracts, photocopies, microfilm of equal value? Um, a transcript, just as a refresher, a transcript is supposed to be an exact copy of the information found in the original record. I have seen some transcripts, what I, which I believe is as accurate as you could get because it includes words that are scratched out. It includes occasionally random marks on the page. So that person was doing by hand what you would accomplish with a photograph. Uh, I'll jump ahead to a photocopy. That's like looking at it with your eyeballs. You see every word written, misspelled, scratched out every random mark that was in the original. An abstract is where somebody decides this is the important information I'm going to copy that. So an abstract does not include all of the information recorded in the original document. It may, but it does not, by definition, include everything. And it would not include errors that are obvious, words that are misspelled and scratched out, etc. Now, if you're confronted with having a transcript, an abstract, and a photocopy, and a microfilm, which one would you believe? Which one would you place the most trust in? Now, from my opinion, a microfilm Im image and a photocopy are the same thing, just different media. But those two are the same as looking at the original because there's no adjustment, assuming that the photocopy and the microfilm were properly exposed, not all faded out and things like that, assuming you can actually read them. They're as good as looking at the original. A transcript might be almost as good as a microfilm, but there still can be errors and omissions. And an abstract is the least uh, reliable. Now we get to a deed book. Well, the deed itself is the first generation document. That was what was recorded by the uh, clerk recording the deed. 
a deed book, which is a record copy of the original, that's a second generation. You can have a transcription of the deed book, that's third generation. There are published books of the transcription, that's the fourth generation. And you can have a microfilm of the published book, that's a fifth generation. Every one of those allows introduction of errors and omissions. And I'll show you a couple of those uh, coming up where it, it wasn't a deed book, but it had to do with a, a census. So every generation, every time the information is, is copied from the original, you introduce the potential of an error. Next slide. Okay, I'm using Ancestry. I'm looking up uh, Josiah Hicks. And I was looking for collecting information from my ancestor for each census that he was named in. Uh, this is a task I've assigned to myself that I want to have a copy of the original census record or microfilm thereof for every census that my ancestor should have been in. So from 1790 to 1950, for example, we can look at 1950. I'm in the 1950 census. My father is in the 1950. He's in the 1940. I can't find him in the 1930. He's in the 1920. And he was born in 1911. So, but I have a copy of the census that he appears in. And then my grandfather, he's in the 1950, in the 40, in the 30, in the 20, and the 10. So each of my ancestors. I am in the process of going back and collecting a copy of the actual original microfilm record of the census they were in. So I'm doing this and here's Josiah. And I, I don't find him in the 1850 census on the ancestry.com record. Next slide. So I look for his wife, Juliana. Well, she's not in the 1850 census. Uh, she's there on the 1880. I can't quite read it on my screen, but she's there in one of them, but she's, she's not in the 1850. So where is Josiah and his wife in 1850? Next slide. Well, here's the 1850 Ohio Agricultural Census. I cover the alternate censuses in my presentation on census. Well, here's Josiah in the 1850 Agricultural Census. So clearly he was in town. He wasn't on vacation in Bermuda or wherever uh, in that summer. So why isn't he in the 1850 census when I go to Ancestry? Next slide. I think you can all read those bottom two names. There are Josiah Hicks and there's Juliana. That is an image from the 1850 federal census. Why doesn't Ancestry or Family Search, why does nobody have them listed? Well, the next slide gives you the, I did some research. Next slide. Alex, next slide, please. Okay. Okay. This is a photograph I took of a book, the Index to Ohio 1850 Federal Census as published by Ohio Genealogical Society. Back in the 1950s and early 60s before the internet, 
genealogical societies, many of them, uh, came up with these programs where they would have members go and look at the microfilm, read the census, transcribe it, and then they would publish books. And there are a number of hardback books. I know Hudson has a few of them, um, different years, from different states, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I went and looked and guess what? Josiah Hicks is not listed in the book published by OGS on the 1850 federal census. But we've seen they are actually in the microfilm original documents. This shows the disadvantage of depending upon a second or third generation bit of information. A mistake was made when the census was read and transcribed and typed to create the page in the book. And the dirty little secret is that, and I bet none of you have thought of this, but Ancestry and Family Search did not go back and reread the census. They took the published books, digitized them, and that is what is used by the computer when you go and do a search. So just because Family Search and Ancestry and Heritage Quest, et cetera, nobody redid the index. They all took the published book. So if you can't find somebody on the internet information, for the web, uh, the web-based federal census, it just says it doesn't says they don't exist or they weren't there. It says that you have to go and find them in the original record. And I was able to find uh, Josiah and Juliana by getting to the records of Ashtabula County, and there's 20 pages of census records. And I read all lines for 20 pages and da -da, there they are. So going back to the original, or in this case, a microfilm of the original is what we need to do if we want to find the holes in the research. Next. Okay, sources associated with the people. Um, be sure you uh, record the source of the information. Now, a little detail here is a source needs to be like that thing we were all exposed to in grade school, author, title, publisher, date, da da da, that we all knew we would never need that information in our lifetime. And I know I had that attitude. Well, <laughs> becoming a genealogist, I've changed that attitude. So now I want to record all of that information. And I'll get into later on, I'll get into how to decide what of that information is important to correct, because not everything is in a nice hardcover published book with author, title, date, publisher, et cetera. But I do try to record the information and my program will give that. Uh, so it references each one of those. Now, one thing you will note, nowhere on this do I have anything like Ancestry.com. Ancestry is not a source. It's just like, I would never put Hudson, Ohio Library. That's not a source. That's a repository. That's where the source is. The source is the uh, US Federal Census, 1850 microfilm, microfilm number M, da 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 da, da whatever it is. 
and I would list the repository, where did I see that microfilm? Because just because I'm looking at a microfilm doesn't mean it's 100% certain. How many copies of microfilm do you think there are? I've confirmed at least two personally, because the image is different. Uh, I believe it was Family Search has one image and Heritage Quest has a second image, and they are different. The information is the same, but the exposure done with the camera is dramatically different. One is legible, the other one's just ink spattered on a page. So the repository, where did I get that data? Where did I see that image? So I have the repository recorded for most of my sources, because I will admit I didn't do this from day one. Initially, I wasn't doing a, as good of a job as I'd like to, as I hope I think I'm doing now. So I am still working to improve the quality of my sources. Now, are all of those dozen sources that I've got on this thing are equal for reliability and accuracy? Look at number four. That's the history of Worcester and people. That's one of those books that somebody ran around town saying, hey, I'm gonna publish a book on the history of Worcester. Do you wanna be in it? Uh, you can subscribe for uh, $9.95. We'll include your information. Want to give us the information, then they collect the information and they publish in the book. Doesn't mean it's absolutely true. Doesn't mean it's false. It becomes circumstantial evidence. However, when I go to, uh, let's say, number, Okay, real estate directory, number eight. Notice I said that's from Ancestry.com, and I even tell you when I found it on Ancestry.com. The real estate directory is maybe a little bit more reliable because that would have been taken from deed books. Okay, number 12 is a marriage certificate, and I have a copy, and the repository is me. Um, I actually need to go back and look at that and tell somebody where you could get a copy of that certificate or where I got that copy. Just because I'm doing it now doesn't mean, just on doing better work now, doesn't mean I was doing what I consider first class work 20 years ago. Next slide, please. Okay, don't trust everything in print. The census index, the person's not in the index, but they're in the microfilm. You saw that. Spelling of a surname. D. Moranville, D. Moranville, Moranville. Uh, digitization errors. When stuff gets read by read by a computer, when you make it digitize a copy, 179I is clearly a mistake. 1791 is the fact. And I ran into this back in the days of CDs where the information had been digitized and the date was referenced as 179I. So when doing a search of the information and you enter the date 1791, which you and I and our brain read as a date, the computer says, nope, there are no 1791s. But if I enter in the search 179i, it shows up. And of course, we all know you can't find everything on the internet. Uh, very few ba family Bibles have been digitized because of the limited interest. In reality, the only people interested would be people in that family. 
And uh, of course, now do remember everything on the internet is true, correct? Usually in my presentations, I get a laugh from the audience with that one. Next slide. Okay, don't fail to document your sources. It will help to avoid duplicating your work. It helps others working on the same ancestors. I have had a couple of people who share the surname Marble and I've been able to help them find their line. Uh, so, and it helped because I could give them some sources to say, have you checked this? Have you checked that? If you're gonna apply for a lineage society, be that first families of Ohio or descendants of Mayflower, you have to have certain levels of documentation for the sources you provide. Different societies have different levels of, uh, let's say quality that they require for their information. Um, and if you document your sources, it may lead you to additional ancestors if you make that effort. Remember that uh, Ed Snell, if I had just taken the first Ed Snell I found and put that and recorded it, if it had been the wrong Ed Snell, I would not have been able to go back another four generations. Part of the benefit of doing that research was I was able to go back four more generations on, on the mine, turned out mine family. Don't accept family legend as fact. Next slide. Don't limit yourself to one spelling. I showed you the Demaranville, M-O-R-A-N-V-I-L-L-E, M-E-R-A-N-V-I-L-E. Um, I even have people spelling marble, M-A-R-B-L-E, M-A-R-A-B-L-E. Confirm the pasture list before you cross the pond. You don't have to pay to gain access to a large part of Ancestry.com. If you go down to your local library or branch library, um, you can get access to the actual records. Now, Ancestry, it's almost like they have two databases. One is uh, images of data and records. The other is the one they advertise on TV and that's the one that's talking about the little, little leaf for here, find your family, et cetera, et cetera. That one is the family trees. And there you are relying upon the competence and quality of work of other people. And you find things like women being married nine times to three different men. Now that's possible. But when you get into it, you'll say, no, that's not real because she didn't marry the same guy. And then at the same time, at the same time, marry somebody else. Um, it is a case where people have done incomplete, sloppy work sometimes. And simply because the name of the individual was the name of the individual they were looking for, they recorded it as if it was true. And remember that little leaf you find may have blown in from somebody else's tree. So I depend upon a source and I try to get to the original source if at all possible, or at least find confirming sources. Uh, Next slide. There are other, you know, people know about the census, birth records and marriage records, but there are other records which can help confirm. 
land records. I have a presentation that I've given in the past on, on land records, digging up your roots in land records, um, where deeds and learning how to trace land records uh, helped find some people. There are court records. That includes wills, legal hearings, court records. There are military records, service records, pension records from the Revolutionary War, newspaper articles. I was lucky to find a extensive newspaper article up in Ashtabula, uh, published in 1860-ish, on a family reunion that was held, like I said, in 1860. And it was like a column and a half, full page, of the everybody that was at the reunion. And it was published in 1860. And it went back to 1811. And part of the thing was the son of the woman that got married in 1811 was at this 1860 reunion. That along with land records and some other information allowed me to make the necessary connection to join the descendants of the Mayflower. Because Orange T. Moranville is in the silver books, which is the recognized correct information from Mayflower, but that gets you to 1811, and I couldn't get up to 1867. But luckily, newspaper articles, land records, and there was one will, and there were a couple of census records were all available, and I was able to use them to prove to their satisfaction that I was descended from Orange. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk a bit about the justice system. They set a court date and consider the evidence available on that date. Um, some reference I've run into, they're saying there's over a 4% error rate among people sentenced to death. And you would hope, think, that if somebody's gonna be sentenced to death, everybody was making a best effort possible to find all of the facts and truth. But they're still getting it wrong 4% of the time. Now, if we're just talking about a marriage date, that's not so critical. And clearly, you can have a much higher error rate on recording that information. Next slide. The law is looking simply for a preponderance evidence. 51% versus 49, that's enough to get you convicted, get you in jail. It's not enough for me, it's not enough for you if you're doing or trying to do competent genealogical research. We want clear and convincing evidence. Next slide. We should work as hard to disprove our evidence as we work to prove it. So when you find something, make it prove itself. Do not, please, do not just say, ah, that's the date I was looking for. Write it down and then move on to somebody else. Make that evidence prove itself to you. Next slide. Okay, evidence. Here are six books. Um, I know that some of those are available um, at the Hudson Library. And some are available, um, matter of fact, the bottom left, Mastering Genealogical Proof, and the bottom right, Documentation. I got my copies for those off of eBay, like $4 a piece or something. And um, the bottom center, Evidence Explained, 
that'll drive you up the wall. It's like an inch plus thick and, but um, the one of the top center citing your sources, that used to be kind of the Bible for how to do source citations pre-internet. And I would say, if you can find a copy of that on eBay for a couple bucks, get it. It will help you develop a good foundation in how you record your source citations. It does not have how to record stuff off the internet, but you can learn how to do that. And uh, you can go too far in this and it'll drive you crazy. Um, but now these books, some are available. Uh, they're relatively new. You can order them and buy them. And some of them you might find at a library. Some of them you might find um, on eBay or something like that. Now, all of this presentation will be uh, available on the Hudson website for the next week to everybody. It's open to the public. A week from now, the presentation will no longer be available to anybody. It will only be available to then current members of the Hudson Gen Society. Uh, as the webmaster, I'm a week or so behind, but right now there are two other presentations that are available on the website, but they probably will not be available by late this afternoon. So you might go to the website and check check out what's available. And I'm trying to make the website a valuable resource. Okay, I don't know if we can do questions and answers, Gwen. Roger, we have several questions and answers, but I think it's worth telling people. Elizabeth Schoen Mills, who's written two of those books, is noted as being one of the experts in the world on evidence. So if Elizabeth Schoen Mills has written about it, I generally believe it. And I once went to a genealogical webinar by Thomas W. Jones. I will never forget Thomas W. Jones. He had a town that had upwards of 20 um, John Smiths. And through evidence, he showed how he had just one John, one of those John Smiths was his John Smith. He is amazing at ferreting out evidence and explaining the background of evidence. So those are both huge people in the genealogical world when it comes to evidence. Gwen, do you have evidence explained there in the library? Yes. There you go, people. You want to go and uh, uh, now, for right now with the, with the library restrictions, you want to uh, need to call, call ahead. Call ahead. And until the library opens up, which hopefully will happen sometime in 2023, but if you call ahead to the library, you can then go upstairs and they will bring out three or four books for you. Got to call ahead. And okay. you can do. I, I have a bunch of questions, so we're going to rattle them off. Okay, go ahead. Someone wants to know is ancestry a derivative since there are mistakes made from recording from the originals? Certainly. There. Um, Catherine says, useful investigation strategies. My guess is that the data from a ship's manifesto must be circumstantial. Is that correct? I would say so. It, it may be the only thing you've got. And um, I don't know what else you might find if you're looking for the date at which they arrived. But I would say, that's not a critical date uh, in doing research, at least I don't think it is. It's just additional information, as long as it doesn't conflict with something else. In other words, you wouldn't want a, a, a court appearance saying, you know, conflicting with the date at which the ship arrived. Um, so it would be additional information puts flesh on the bones and I would record that information if you have access to it. Catherine wants to know a little bit about Josiah and Joseph and abbreviations. 
Josiah, Joseph, and what? Abbreviations. Oh, <laughs> good luck. Um, the best you can do is record the information you've got and see if you can um, figure it out. It's just like the, that Ed, Edward, and Edwin. Um, he was listed differently in the censuses. Um, and that was clearly a case of a different person answered the door and answered the question of what's the name of the head of the household. Um, I don't know what Ed himself preferred. I don't know what his wife preferred. And um, I bet a few choice names. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, so I have, you know, I have just recorded the information as found in the document at the time. Uh, I don't think that's a critical uh, bit. It, it certainly, I wouldn't use that by itself to disqualify a bit of information. Dorothy wants to know about original census records. Are they held at the county level? Uh, no, usually the, the original paper documents are gone. I mean, for all intents and purposes, they're gone. The best you can do is to look at the microfilm uh, rolls. Now, I know that a lot of local libraries and local gen societies, and even at state, have physical microfilm rolls in the library. I mean, I know Hudson has X number of rolls of microfilms from certain years of Summit County. I know that Ohio Gen Society down there uh, in Belleville, they have many drawers full of microfilm rolls. Uh, and of course you could go to the archives, but most of the microfilm rolls of the US federal census, I can't say all because I, I haven't checked on all, but most of them are available on the internet and they're for free. They're not indexed, however. So use Ancestry, use Family Search, whatever, and use their search engine to see if you can get access to the microfilm image. You know, you do a search on Ancestry, you enter the person's name, you and you get a bunch of entries and some of the options from family search and some of the options from ancestry are you get to look at the actual image of the page and then i save a copy of that image to my computer um there's also and and i found this is how i found the uh, the missing hicks family there's also a website and you go to internetarchives.com. Then you, it is a little bit like Google, but it's a library, if you will. And you go to internetarchives.com and you would enter Ohio 1850 census. That's your search term. It will give you two results because the microfilm roll for Ohio in 1850 took up two rolls. Oh, Ashtabula, in my case, I knew the county. So there's two rolls of film that cover Ashtabula County. The files are large, but you can download them. It'll take you a few minutes. They run about 400 meg. Don't do this on your phone you'll actually need a computer. But you can download the entire roll of microfilm, the counties and the townships within the county are alphabetized uh, in sequence. And so in my case, I ended up Ashtabula County, Monroe Township, and there were some like 20 pages on one microfilm roll and eight or 10, I think, on the next roll. It just happened to split the township. But 
So I actually got, um, yeah, I see the comment on the repository. Yeah, you, you can go to a repository, but personally, I found it much easier um, to download the microfilm role uh, for those locations I was interested in. And I've got it on a, on a big hard drive um, you know, 400 meg, that's a good size file. Now it's not, they're not alphabetized. This is just as the page, page one, page two, page three, et cetera. And if you're reading the microfilm, the advantage of having it on your computer, you get to zoom, you get to change contrast, make it the image easier to view. Mimi says, is the repository on Franklin Avenue in Cleveland still there or did it get moved to another place? Have you don't been there, know I don't know because I haven't bothered to go to the repositories. Usually, uh, uh, I mean, for me, I had, I needed, in Ohio, I only needed Ashtabula County. And matter of fact, a couple of times I've gone up to Ashtabula Library, I didn't need that because I had already downloaded the microfilm to my computer. Mindy, that's the Cuyahoga County archives you're talking about, and they are going to move. They were in the process of moving last I knew. The person that will know right away is Nancy Brock, and I don't think she's online today, but no, I would Nancy call. Said she, Nancy said she could not make it today. I would call, um, just look up Cuyahoga County archives and ask, because they were in the process of moving down to the um, downtown corridor. It's my understanding they might be very close to the Jake building. Is that what they call it, where the casino is? Roger. Don't know. Oh, all right. So call, Mindy. Um, let's see. There are lots of thank yous, and they all praise you for doing this labor intensive work, Roger. So, um, and we need to give Alex a huge round of applause. Great, Alex. Alex helped us through our technological glitches. Oh, someone else says this week the Plain Dealer has an article about the property records from 1810 in Cuyahoga, Cali, Cuyahoga County that are available online. Yes, I have used that a great deal this week. I think it's a wonderful um, database of, it's an index of the property records from Cuyahoga County from 1810 until today. So if you get a chance, look it up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to Roger, thank you to Alex. Thank you all for coming. Go out and do some great searches. And prove your evidence. Yes, thank you. All right, other than that, I think we're done for the day. And remember next month, I believe it's December 10th, right, Roger? Yes, December 10th, check the website. Yes. <laughs> All right. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye. Okay. Bye.